Hello, and welcome to this episode of Midlife Men with me, Philip Briscoe. Today, I'm joined by Darren Ellsley. Darren is the founder of an underwear brand called Bollocks, which aims to highlight men's cancers. Well, Darren, <laughs> thanks a lot. Can you start by talking about the background to Bollocks? You know, why did you set it up? It started, it's not a great start. It started when one of my friends was diagnosed with cancer. It wasn't men's cancer, it was bowel cancer. But by the time it was diagnosed, it had gone to his pleura, so it was secondary cancer. Sadly, a couple of years after that, he died just after his 40th birthday. So that had a huge impact on me. He was one of my closest friends from school. First time cancer had ever entered my kind of life. So basically, after he passed, I started doing a few charity rides. I did like the London to Brighton off-road. Oddly, I did it for the Heart Foundation. I'm not too sure why I did the Heart Foundation, but I just wanted to do something for charity. And then during that ride, I was sort of thinking to myself, oh, I'm not going to do this all the time. You know, I just thought I'm not going to sustain this, doing lots of charity events. So I wanted to have a product which would raise cancer awareness that everyone would want to have or buy, or and then a certain amount of that purchase price would go to a charity. It would raise awareness for, for the cancer. And maybe because I was doing the 75-mile ride on a bike. I've always loved the word bollocks. I've always used the word bollocks because it's, it's such a great little word. And I thought, oh, my God, underwear. Call it bollocks. It does exactly what it says on the tin. So that was this the initial kind of concept. And obviously, I, I had sort of like eight hours of cycling to kind of figure it out. So as I was sort of cycling along, the whole plan was, uh, by the time I finished the ride, I had this whole plan in my head. So I sort of went over and said to the wife, I want to do a, a men's underwear brand. And I want to call it Bollocks, but I want to do it B-O-L-L-O-X. So it's like a play on words. So the concept was there very, very quickly. And then you get down to the nitty gritty. Okay, where are they made? What are they made of? I didn't have a clue. My background was in print. I was running a printing business. So that was useful because I had the design and how I wanted it to look from a design perspective. That was relatively easy. But yeah, where do I get them manufactured? How many do I need to get? What's the material? So I had to have quite a learning curve. And obviously I had a full-time job. So it took a couple of years for this to sort of take place. And I was flip-flopping between, yes, I'm doing it. Oh, actually, no, I'm not. It's a stupid idea. No, yes, I'm going to do it. Oh, this is costing too much. I'm not going to do it. So it kind of flip-flopped for a good couple of years. Were you doing it in your spare time then? I was doing it in my spare time, yeah. So evenings and weekends, just to put the sort of concept together. The biggest challenge was trademarking it because obviously I thought if it does go well, you know, I need to trademark the brand. So luckily I did network quite a lot in my role as in print and I met a lovely guy from IP Assets and he said he'd help me trademark it with the intellectual property office. And I got that would be a simple process. Trademarking bollocks. Trademarking bollocks, but it wasn't. <laughs> the first thing they said was you can't trademark it because it's an offensive term. And I just thought, that's absolute bollocks. <laughs> you just That's not an offensive term. There are far more offensive terms to be had. You wouldn't call somebody a bollocks. So anyway, we had to do survey after survey to prove that bollocks wasn't an offensive term. And eventually they did change their mind. And so I owned bollocks which was amazing. So I had to be fairly determined and stubborn not to just give up because it's so easy just to think, oh, I can't trademark it. I ain't going to bother because I can't protect it. But yeah, so that was a huge step. So you managed Um, to change the uh, the the intellectual property. Yeah, the intellectual property office had to kind of go, okay, you you actually can trademark it for underwear because you obviously have different items you can do it for, you know, different products. So it was for underwear, which was great. So we got that done. So you're running this in your spare time. Mm Mm-hmm weekends and and evenings and then you've got a full-time job as well yeah so how did you manage the two and at what point did you decide that you were going to put your energy and focus entirely into the the underwear initially it was a part-time thing so i had a full-time job so i had an income pay for the mortgage and all the things you have to pay for and i was quite happy for it to be like that actually you know i I didn't have a like a global domination plan i just thought i'd just let it evolve keep it local you know local business selling men's underwear in oxfordshire and that sort of thing and that went well, on for fine. And then I started to get to a point where I did want it to, to grow. So that, that's when it comes quite tricky because you want to put more effort into your... I know the business wasn't growing because I was only putting, say, 10% of my time into it. If I'm honest, I wasn't entrepreneurial enough or risky enough just to give up my job to do it because it was like, oh, what if it failed? And you've got, oh my God, I've got, you know, you've got, you've got a mortgage, you've got children. And I'm sure there are thousands of people who are in that position. But my relationship when I was working was kind of deteriorating. And uh, oddly, about six months before 
I did actually just decide to shift over and do bollocks full time. I was actually thinking about just jacking it all in and going, you know what? I need to just concentrate on my job. That's what I'll do. I'll just carry on with the job. And that, that's my career. That's my future. But it wasn't working. So it was time, that the time, time point? to leave. Yes, it's time to leave. And within, within about two weeks, it was kind of like I was I decided I was going to reduce the effort I was putting into the underwear just to keep it small to actually write this is full time. I'm going to go for it. So I just invested a bit more money into it. And, and that's when it was like that was a tipping point, really. And as with most things, the more effort you put into it, the more you give it some attention. It just naturally starts to grow. Just what advice would you give to someone who's doing a job they don't really want to do, their passions elsewhere, but they've got commitments, mortgage, children? What would you say? I think it's easy retrospectively to always say something is a good idea. But I think if you have got something you really, really want to do, you should just go for it. You're on this planet once. If it doesn't work out, you get another job. Life carries on. So I think you just need to take a look at yourself. If you've got the determination and love and the passion, you've got to have all those things to start a business, to start a brand. You've got to have all those things. There are so many challenges along the way. You need that passion, love, commitment, determination, thick skin, (laughs) stubbornness. You need all those things. So if you're going to give up a perfectly good job, to follow up a passion, you've got to have all those things. Otherwise, you'll give up very quick, you know, fairly quickly. It won't work because there are just there are endless obstacles in the way. Or you can just evolve your business and your brand and your passion slowly until you get to that tipping point where you think, actually, I can draw an income from this. It's getting at the right time before you just jack it all in because we all have bills to pay and commitments. But yeah, I'd say to anyone who has got something they want to do is to make it work and put some effort into it. So going back to the brand, the Bollocks brand, what does it stand for? Uh, How have you helped promote men's health with the brand? Fundamentally, the brand Bollocks is about raising awareness for men's cancers. So you've got testicular, prostate and penile cancers. Testicular cancer is kind of directed between sort of like 15 to 45. Then prostate is for sort of like, you know, 45 to end of life. So I think penile cancer, any age, less known. And luckily it's not picked up as, as quickly. So the sort of the rate of, of finding that cancer is early is less because men don't like to sort of find something on their penis and they don't want to tell anybody, show anybody because their penis. Men aren't very good at going to the doctors and getting their dick out or their balls out. It's a huge thing for some men to do that. Getting better, but potentially embarrassing for them. So the underwear is all about raising men's cancer awareness. And we also do 10% of our profits goes to a men's cancer charity because I think the brand just works well for charities. I wanted a brand, a quality pair of underwear, raise men's cancer awareness, and to donate money to men's cancer charities. I think you were telling me you've done some workshops. Yeah, so when I was networking, one of the things that they wanted speakers, I was asked, do you want to talk about your brand and talk about men's health? So the first one, I think most people, when they start any business or any start talking about it, there was a bit of imposter syndrome type thing. I was thinking what people are going to think of me because I am promoting my brand but also promoting men's health. So for me, wrongly, I think there was just a conflict of going, oh, can't get away from the synergy. I go to these events. The first one was awful. I felt absolutely terrible. I was embarrassed because I was talking about men's health and holding up a pair of latex testicles. Fantastic little gadget. So you have a latex testicles and you send it around the room and everyone's trying to feel the lump inside them. But on the first one, I got such good positive feedback and I got such a lot out of it delivering that message. And the latex testicles was just fantastic. Breaking the ice, letting everyone feel a pair of latex testicles. And you're kind of like friends with everybody really, really quickly. (laughs) People do share their experiences, which I quite enjoy. One lady was telling me that her husband, oh, my husband's only got one testicle. And he's looking at her as if say, Jesus, (laughs) why don't you just tell the world? (laughs) Personal. (laughs) What sort of feedback did you get from people in the room, men and women? People like the honesty, the awareness, because, you know, I say I'm conscious because it's my brand. So I'm conscious of men's health, of checking all the rest of it. But it's amazing how many stories you get where men don't check themselves ever. And it's just something that's just not on their radar. And a lot of people didn't know, like you said, oh, you know, check for lumps in your testicles. What is the lump? How big is it? Where would it be? How hard is it to find? And when you have these latex testicles, I was amazed how difficult it was to find how deep you had to push, you know. And obviously, if that was your testicles, you wouldn't necessarily want to push that hard. When do you check? There's no point checking your balls when they're cold and they're like a little walnut because you can't feel a thing. 
they need to be warm. So you have a, you run, you have a shower or you need to be in the bath and that's the time to check it. So it seems like common sense when to check. But again, if you don't, it's actually told you. And so it was a good way to get people to feel where roughly it could be and how tricky it is to feel a lump. And also all the other signs and symptoms, because it's not just the lump that you might not be able to feel, it's all the other signs and symptoms which you want to get across. And so in the leaflet on the underwear, inside every pack, there is the signs and symptoms leaflet. And I've spoken to the charities, so it aligns with the charities and their objectives of the signs and symptoms. Why do you think some men don't check or the discussion isn't there? It's a whole host of things. I think it's not taught about probably at a young enough age. Every child has a different relationship with their parents. Some parents are very open about discussing this sort of thing. Some parents are embarrassed to talk to their children, not just about men's health, but about hygiene, about sex, you know, so they don't even have that conversation. So how are they going to talk about checking your balls for men's cancers? As a kid, you might go, oh, shut up. What do you know? You're old. (laughs) Well, I don't want to talk about that. I'm too busy enjoying myself. And that's where I again think bollocks comes into its own because it's a great name. If they get a pair of bollocks underwear, I have parents who email me and they say, oh, I gave my son a pair of these underwear. And we had a conversation the first time ever. We've had a conversation about men's health, not just about cancers, but also hygiene, sex, that subject, which is so for some families is completely taboo. So it certainly gets the conversation started, which is the first point. Do you think we're still quite prudish talking about, especially men talking about, you know, their balls or their yeah. penises? Do you think they're just, the last thing you want to do is go and I don't know, it's just, it's just not the done thing. Like we went, like when I went networking, we were sat around a table and there was sort of like five men and five women. And we were talking about the brand bollocks and we were talking about men's health, how people talk about it. But the women were straight away talking about breast cancer, checking their breasts, you know, cervical smears. And they're happy to just chat about it. Their experiences of having smears, you know, putting the legs in the stirrups and they just chat about it. But all the men, none of us talked about bollocks and men's cancers. Even though we were talking about the underwear brand, we still never really talked and there was no honesty, if you like, from the five guys. But the women were talking about their experiences and they just chat about it much more easier. Maybe that's because I've got a wife and two daughters, maybe because they've got, from an early age, they're exposed to periods, they have smears and breast examinations. And so I think they're brought up with it. They're fairly at ease with it. Whereas men don't have any checks at all. We don't have any ball checks or dick checks. When we're younger, it's a personal thing. So maybe that's a starting point of kind of like it's private. It's not the sort of thing that's discussed in the pub, is it, with your, uh, your friends? Not by most. N- no, no, not by most men. It's getting better, but even now, I don't think men are fully aware of the consequences of, say, prostate cancer. They hear the word prostate cancer, but they're not aware of the consequences of having prostate cancer if it's not caught early and how it can affect your sex life and it can can make you incontinent. Even I wasn't aware of it when I started this whole process, but I've become aware of it, of the signs of the effects you can have. And obviously, if you've you've got a partner, you're married or whatever, the knock-on effect it has on them, it affects your partner. So the earlier the diagnosis of going to a doctor and the earlier you can be saying, yeah, yes, there's a, there's a problem there, the better the survival, the better the outcome. So it all makes sense to talk about it and to go to the doctor as soon as you possibly can if you have any worries or concerns. But it's amazing how people who don't because they stick their head in the sand and go, oh, I don't want to know. But the longer they leave it, the worse the outcome is going to be, which is just a bizarre mindset, isn't it? And what would you like the legacy of the Bollocks brand to be? Just to contribute to saving lives, raising men's cancer awareness. That's the legacy of it, really. Whether it's a a huge global brand eventually or a small brand in Oxfordshire or wherever, I know that out of the thousands we've sold, everyone's read that leaflet and maybe it has saved someone's life. One lady emailed me and said she gave it to her son and they've never talked about it before. But He went upstairs, tried the box shorts on. He was up there longer than she expected, but he actually read the leaflet. And she said he never reads anything, but he read this leaflet. And he come down and he did say, I have had an ache in my testicles for the last two or three months. He said, but I didn't want to say anything, but there was a dull ache there. So she took him to the doctors and it turned out it was just growing pains and it was, there was nothing untoward going on. But she said they wouldn't have had that conversation without the boxer shorts. And that's kind of like the legacy of the underwear is getting that conversation started. And that's pretty cool, I think. Tell me about the underwear themselves how's that developed over time they've changed initially when i first started i had really much of a clue about fit and cut so i kind of like was relying on the manufacturer to give me a pair of underwear which fitted okay and felt nice it was really all about the brand 
But that's changed over the years. And we're just about to launch a new cut. It's mainly bamboo based with a cotton mix because bamboo is more eco friendly. But 100% bamboo, it piled, it didn't last as long. So we've got a bamboo cotton mix. So it's got the eco element to it, but also they're more durable. Really nice and soft, feel lovely. And you know, I feel like you're wearing them. They're so soft. And we've incorporated a comfy ball pouch. So we've trialled them. They just feel lovely, and which is what I wanted. I wanted a quality underwear delivering an important message. And that's what we've got. So yeah, so we're just about to launch our new style, which I'm well excited about. So what's the future for the Bollocks brand? How are you extending it? For the brand itself, about a year and a half, two years ago, we introduced characters because obviously the bollocks underwear is a, I wanted a stylish pair of underwear so people will have some stylish underwear to wear but also I think with the word bollocks there's a great opportunity for novelty underwear still delivering that message but in a novelty way so for me if someone's going to buy some underwear if I can get that message out I don't care if they're buying it as a quality pair of underwear or they want to go from down the novelty line so we've introduced Mr Clever Bollocks Mr Lazy Bollocks we've got Mr Rolled Bollocks we've got little bollocks characters which get printed onto the obviously onto the underwear they're going quite well you know so I, we started off with Mr Lazy and Mr Clever Bollocks because they're kind of like the two most popular names we always in the family there's always somebody who's clever and somebody who's lazy we have great conversations at events about mr lazy and mr clever but mr old bollocks i love that character because he's like a little pair of saggy pair of balls with a little walking stick for mr old bollocks and again for a parent to buy or a son to buy or a daughter to buy their dad a pair of mr old bollocks is just classic because once you're 50 for your kids you're old <laughs> and then we've got mr ginger bollocks we've got mr perfect bollocks what does mr perfect bollocks look like he's perfect <laughs> Obviously, it's a perfect pair of bollocks. Probably in reality, there is no such thing, <laughs> apart from if you're looking at your own bollocks. <laughs> and Valentine's Day, we're just introducing Mr. Horny Bollocks. So <laughs> there we go. <laughs> and if people want to buy a pair of bollocks or two pairs of bollocks, where so, do they go? Yeah, simply just go onto our website, which is www.mybollocks.co.uk. So what advice would you give to anyone listening who thinks there's something not quite right you know, but they're too afraid or embarrassed or it's, don't really want to. Yeah, it's, to it's, it's not rocket science. Just go to the doctor. Talk to your partner if you need some encouragement to go. Don't die of ignorance. Don't die of stupidity. And the chances are there's nothing wrong. So the earlier the diagnosis, the better the outcome. By going to the doctors and getting yourself checked out, it doesn't change the fact that you have or haven't got it. Going to the doctors and getting diagnosed doesn't mean that because you've gone, you know, you've suddenly got cancer, you may have cancer. So just go and get it checked because the outcome can only be improved. Well, thank you. I've really enjoyed talking bollocks with you, Darren. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Midlife Men. If you'd like to visit the Bollocks online shop, then go to www.mybollocks.co.uk. If you have a suggestion for a topic you'd like us to cover in the podcast, or if you have a story you'd like to share, then please contact me either on Twitter at MidlifeMen or email me at midlifemen01 at gmail.com. Join me next time when we talk to other midlife men about their stories and maybe you'll find that they resonate with you. Thank you.